Lady in Waiting first aired on December 15, 1971, and as you might guess, this is the final episode for the year of 71. It was written by both Stephen Bochco and Barney Slater. Yes, this is the best picture I could find of Barney Slater. Actually, it's the only picture I found. We've already met Stephen Bochco because he wrote Murder by the Book. He specifically wrote the teleplay for Lady in Waiting, but the actual story was created by Barney Slater. Mr. Slater also did a lot of writing for Tombstone Territory, Tales of Wells Fargo, and a Lost in Space TV series. And this episode was directed by Norman Lloyd. He did a lot of directing for Alfred Hitchcock Presents. So our episode begins with a helicopter night shot of the city. I suppose this must be Los Angeles, though it isn't actually as bright and lit up as it was in Ransom for a Dead Man when they showed a night view of the city during the ransom drop. And now we are outside of a large home. Zooming into a window, we find a sleeping man. In sneaks a pajama-clad woman who begins messing with what must be the man's set of keys. I had that same set of General Motors keys for my old Buick. Oval for opening the doors and trunk, square for the ignition. Anyway, it seems this shifty lady has removed a key from his set, and she successfully tiptoes back out of the room. Now, it must be the next morning. Breakfast out in the garden. Morning, Charles. Good morning. Good morning, Beth. Beth is hiding behind the newspaper for breakfast. I like how much this man enjoys his orange juice. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, Beth. Hmm? You are sulking. I'm not sulking. Beth, now listen to me. He isn't for you. You have no right to control my life. Your life in this case is tied in with an employee of the company. We learn very soon that this man having breakfast with Beth is her brother. He runs their prosperous family-owned company and is concerned that the man Beth is dating is not only an employee of the company, but is also a gold digger. I won't let you be used, Beth. Therefore, I've taken the appropriate steps. Charles? Yes, sir. Car ready? What do you mean you're yes, taking appropriate Good. steps? Bryce, what have you done? Bryce explains that he has written a letter to her boyfriend, Peter Hamilton, telling him to lay off his sister or he will be fired. What? I do understand why Bryce would be cautious of men wanting to date his sister for her money. But what he says next really turns our sympathy towards Beth. If your name wasn't Chadwick and you didn't uh, have all of this, do you really think that Peter Hamilton would give you a second look? That really cuts deep for a woman to be told something like this. We get the idea from the rest of their argument that her whole life has been kept on tight reins by first her father and now her brother. Anything I wanted to do on Beth. my own, you or he prevented Beth, it. Beth, this is hardly the time. Once Bryce leaves, we see Beth cling to the key she stole the night before. Beth is played by Susan Clark. She acted in Coogan's Bluff, Valdez is Coming, Skin Game, the Apple Dumpling Gang, as well as the TV movies Something for a Lonely Man, Double Solitaire, and Babe, for which she won a Primetime Emmy Award. She was also in every episode of Webster and almost every episode of Emily of New Moon, which is currently the last bit of acting she's done since the year 2000. She then asks the butler if tomorrow is his day off. I really like this dolly camera shot coming up with Charles. Along with the music in the background, this shot almost feels like a like something from a horror film. But if you'd like me to stay... Oh, no, no, that won't be necessary. As you wish. Uh, may I bring you more coffee? Charles is played by Joel Flewellen. You'll find him in the Jackie Robinson story, Friendly Persuasion, The Learning Tree, and The Great White Hope. Scene change to the phone ringing and Beth answering. Hello? Darling! How are you? Whoa, it's Leslie Nielsen. Surely you know him. You don't? Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. So, this is Peter Hamilton, Beth's boyfriend. As I mentioned, he is played by Leslie Nielsen. You will surely know him from his infamous work in Airplane, as well as the cancelled too soon show Police Squad, which inspired the Naked Gun trilogy. But at this point in his career, he was not the funny man he will always be remembered for. He acted in films like Ransom, Forbidden Planet, Hot Summer Night, and The Sheep Man, as well as starring in the TV series The New Breed and guest appearing on a wealth of other TV shows and movies. 
We will also see Leslie Nielsen in a future Columbo episode. A bit of trivia that relates to both Susan Clark and Leslie Nielsen is that they are both Canadian and they later are in a movie together called City on Fire, which was filmed in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. It is overall rated pretty poorly as a film, but some people enjoy those B-minus movies. Well, Peter just called to tell Beth he misses her and that he wants to come see her as soon as his plane lands tonight. Beth insists he should come visit her tomorrow because it would be much better. And so they end their darling conversation. Darling! Darling! Hello! Uh, darling? Goodbye, darling. Beth again has a look at that key and leans over to set it in her nightstand next to, you guessed it, a gun. The model of this gun is again a Smith & Wesson Model 36. It has been a very popular gun in the series so far, bumping off Jim Ferris and Murder by the Book. I I know. This will be the last time that I can... Jimmy? And Uncle Rudy in Suitable for Framing. The scene fades into Beth switching out the light bulb that hangs over the porch with a burnt out bulb. What is this sly little lady up to? Then Beth checks to make sure the French doors to her room are unlocked and turns on the alarm system with a button right next to her bed. She looks rather innocently excited as she pulls back the covers. The camera pans to her nightstand where a porcelain doll sits. I've never been a big fan of porcelain dolls. Then she sets down a glass of water and a bottle of pills as well as the gun and the key. She's all prepared now except for one vital ingredient, a box of chocolates. As she reaches for her first piece of chocolate, the camera changes angles and now suddenly there are five or so empty wrappers on the bed. She really inhaled those chocolates. Look at that, (laughs) look at that intense chocolate eating expression. I understand, Beth. There are times when it's difficult to control yourself when it comes to delicious chocolates. So as Beth drifts into a chocolate-induced vision, we get a clear-cut idea of what her plan is. Bryce comes home, can't find his house key, he rings the doorbell. I like how even in her vision she's stuffing her face with chocolate. So Bryce goes around to the French doors leading to her room. She tells him to come in and that the doors are unlocked. He reminds her to turn off the alarm. She assures him that it's off. He walks through the doors, which sounds the alarm, and she shoots him dead. Then she is to replace the house key, throw his keys in the bushes to look like he dropped them in the dark. She also needs to break the pane of glass in her door that was meant to have been broken by Bryce to get into her room. Her ultimate plan is to explain that she thought a burglar had entered her room and since she had taken some sleeping pills, she did not hear him until the alarm rang and so she shot him. It was meant to be a terrible mistake. I guess you have to hand it to Beth to kill her brother and publicly claim it as an accident rather than the typical route of killing someone and then acting like you have no idea what's going on. That is unique about this particular story. Our scene now changes to an airplane coming in for landing. Captain, how soon can you land? I can't tell. You can tell me I'm a doctor. No, I mean I'm just not sure. We then see Peter Hamilton arrive with his luggage. What an interesting room divider. There's so much orange and brown and green. This room is heavy with the 70s. Peter begins casually looking through his mail and is taken by one letter in particular. Well, that does it. And now we see Bryce arriving home in his 1971 Lincoln Continental. The same make and model Aunt Edna had and suitable for framing. This remote gate opening seems very impressive for the time. Bryce begins looking at his key ring, confused, noticing the light is burnt out. By the way, the music in this episode is composed by Billy Goldenberg. We know him very well by now, because along with Lady in Waiting, he has so far done the music for Ransom for a Dead Man, Murder by the Book, and Suitable for Framing. Well, Bryce rings the doorbell a couple times, which triggers Beth to get into position for when Bryce knocks on her French doors. Bryce continues checking his keys, and then suddenly here comes Peter, screeching around the corner in his 1968 Mercedes-Benz 280SL, and coming to a sudden halt, finding that the gate is locked. Back to Beth, very nervously waiting for Bryce to come to her door with the gun pointed. After some time has passed, she decides to lower the gun and then... Beth? (gasps) Bryce? Bryce mentions he lost his key to the front door and Beth innocently asks how he got in. With this? A spare. Well, looks like Bryce kept a spare outside. Real quick before things go sideways, 
Bryce is played by Richard Anderson. He co-starred with Leslie Nielsen in Forbidden Planet. He was also in Paths of Glory, The Long Hot Summer, Curse of the Faceless Man, and appeared in every episode of Bus Stop and Dan August, and several episodes of Perry Mason, The Six Million Dollar Man, and Bionic Woman, as well as being the narrator for Kung Fu, The Legend Continues. Back to Beth being horrified about there being a spare key. Why didn't you answer? I was ringing... Peter hears these gunshots, and this is really the first time we kind of watch the victim die. Bryce looks up at Beth in disbelief after being shot three times in the torso. Cut to Peter climbing the gate, and then Beth setting off the alarm system manually. Finally, Bryce falls to the ground dead. I like the editing here. Bryce and Peter hit the ground at the same time. Now Beth has to act fast because surely the police will be arriving with the alarm ringing. She drags Bryce's bullet riddled and blood gushing body to the French doors to properly set up her original plan. Oh, look at all that blood. Then races to put the house key back with the rest of his keys. And here comes Peter running with all his might and leaps like a gazelle to get to the house. Beth finds Bryce's briefcase in the foyer and runs back to her room. If you have a look at the pane of glass before Beth breaks it, you can kind of tell it's different from the rest. It even has a different frame around it. I'm sure it was swapped with some special movie glass, and I'm also sure it had to be broken multiple times. As Beth closes the curtain, we find Peter tries to get into the door and rings the bell, bringing us to some very convincing acting and camera work to show the intensity and fear coming from Beth. She's still got to get rid of these keys and figure out what to do with the spare. Peter rings and rings the doorbell while Beth hurriedly hesitates to the door, hiding the spare behind the statue, and opens the door. Bear! What is it? I shot Bryce! You what? Peter runs to go check out the scene as Beth creeps outside to get rid of those keys. Beth recollects the spare and stands there, staring wild-eyed at Peter as he delivers the news. Beth is dead. A bit of time has passed and we see a couple paramedics getting into their Ford F-100 panel to haul off poor Bryce. Notice among the police cruisers is Columbo's Peugeot. He's here. Inside the house there are a group of policemen and investigators huddled around the door. This man right here is what seems to be the fingerprint technician, noticing his little tackle box he's carrying around. He's played by Bob Harks. He is one of our super uncredited actors to add to the list. Bob has over 530 acting parts, and almost all of them are uncredited. We're going to see his face in nine more future Columbo episodes. So we find Columbo looking at the newspaper in the entryway with an interested expression, and he walks into the room where Beth and Peter are. I was half asleep because I'd taken a sleeping pill. What time did you go to bed tonight, Miss Chadwick? The detective questioning Beth to try to get her story straight is played by Gary Wahlberg. He is best known for his role as Frank Monahan in Quincy M.E. So Beth says she went to bed around 9.30. I didn't feel very well yesterday, so I didn't go out. Uh, excuse me? Uh, did I hear you say you stayed home today? You didn't go out at all? Uh, no, that's what I said. Thank you. The other detective questioning Peter is played by Richard Bull. He was in several episodes of Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, but is most known for his role as Nels Olsen in Little House on the Prairie. The detectives want to know why Peter came over tonight. It's a little involved, uh... As Beth sits alone on the couch, Peter explains that they are in a relationship together. Detective Wahlberg, who is sitting next to her, must have left. Miss Chadwick and I have been seeing each other. Bryce objected. So you came over here to kind of have it out with him? I suppose you could put it that way. We found these outside in the bushes. Beth is asked if these are her brother's keys. I see Detective Wahlberg is back. Beth confirms those are Bryce's keys. We found these outside in the bushes. Where did you find them? In the bushes, ma'am. The detective is still trying to get Beth's story straight. You took a sleeping pill before you retired. Would you mind telling me what happened after that? I heard the glass break and the alarm. I thought it was a burglar. It was pitch dark and I was half asleep because I'd taken the sleeping pill. I reached for the gun, and then I just started shooting. So she took a sleeping pill. I'd taken a sleeping pill. You took a sleeping pill. I'd taken the sleeping pill. Therefore, she was supposed to have been in a groggy state. And I was half asleep. And the lights were off. It was pitch dark. And everyone believes she hit her target all three times, even though she describes it as just shooting. And then I just started shooting. 
I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> then Peter tries to kick out the detectives so that Beth can get some rest. All right, fellas. Wrap it up. Well, wait a minute. There's Bob Harks again, still walking towards the door with his buddy. From the looks of it, this is the first part of the scene we saw earlier, but it was cut and placed here instead. And then here's Beth, looking like a limp invalid. Excuse me, were you and your brother the only ones that were living here? Well, except for Charles and the maid. Who is Charles? The butler. I suppose he's off tonight? Yes. That alone tips off Columbo. Another case where the house help has the night off and someone gets murdered in a mansion. Now a daytime view of the Chadwick residence. We see a cab pull up right behind Columbo's car. Out of the cab comes a little Yorkie looking dog that takes an immediate dislike to Columbo. Following the dog is Bryce and Beth's mother. Not Enrico, darling. Not, be nice, darling. Be nice. Oh, you there. Pay the cab and bring my luggage. Well, she seems like a nice lady herself, doesn't she? I like how annoyed Columbo looks as he watches her walk away. Columbo asked the cab driver if she had any luggage. Right here. I also love Columbo's face during this scene, too, at how unhelpful the cabbie was. And there's 1050 on that meter. 1050 in 1971 is equal to $75 today in 2022. Man, our dollar has really lost its value, and the future isn't looking too bright for it either. You may be wondering why the cab fare was so expensive. Well, they seem to imply Mrs. Chadwick took a cab from her home in Palm Desert, which is about a two and a half hour drive to the Chadwick mansion in Los Angeles. I love how Columbo eyes the cab driver while he checks his pockets. Gee, I've only got $11. Uh, well, go ahead. Keep it all. This cab driver is played by Fred Draper. We'll come across him again in five future Columbo episodes. He also co-starred with Peter Falk in the film A Woman Under the Influence. Anyway, Columbo hauls the woman's luggage without a word. Enrico starts barking at him again. Now, Enrico, come here, come here, come here. That is a tough little monkey you got there. Enrico is not a monkey. He's a pedigreed silky. Oh, it's a silky, not a Yorkie. Uh, my name is Columbo, ma'am. I'm a uh, lieutenant uh, from the police. Yes, I see you back there, Bryce. Well... I must say, you hardly look the role. Well, you know how it is. Yes, Columbo, I know how it is. Oh, that reminds me. We weren't given the little joke about Columbo not looking like a cop when we watched Suitable for Framing. She asks if he brought her bags in, and Columbo says yes and mentions the cab fare. And then Beth shows up. Here I am, Mother. You killed my son. Mrs. Chadwick is played by Jessie Royce Landis. She was in To Catch a Thief, North by Northwest, and Goodbye Again. This part in Columbo was her final acting role. She passed away just a few months after this episode aired. I'm sorry, Lieutenant. This must be very embarrassing for you. No, not really, no. Uh, you see, I come from a very big family, and at dinner time it was like, well, you know, Madison Square Garden. Columbo mentions he smelled coffee when he came in, so Beth leaves to get the coffee. He was a special man, Lieutenant. He took over from my husband in many ways, including dealing with Beth and her problems. Mrs. Chadwick says that Beth is something of a child who bases all of her decisions on emotion, where Bryce was far more perceptive and mature. He never married, did he? Why was that? What are you implying? Columbo says no offense, he just seemed like a very distinct and unique man. Mrs. Chadwick agrees that he was, and he had far too many responsibilities as well as running the business that he just never met the right woman. I don't know what's going to happen to the company now. I certainly can't run it, and I don't want to bring anyone in from the outside. You won't have to. Beth mentions she is an officer of the company, but her mother retorts her implying she knows nothing about the company. You aren't even capable of running your own life. I've never been allowed to run my own life. But things are different now, aren't they? There's a change in the status quo. Beth asks what it is Columbo needed. No, I only have one problem, and that is, thank you. Cream I, sugar? Uh, no, I take it black, okay. thank you. Ah, now we know how Columbo likes his coffee. Here's a small inconsistency that's kind of fun to watch. The color of Beth's cookie regularly changes from white to brown between takes. She must be devouring those cookies as fast as she inhaled those chocolates the other night. 
Columbo says he had trouble sleeping last night because there are a couple of points that bothered him. That newspaper. Newspaper? Columbo doesn't understand how that newspaper got there since Beth mentioned she didn't leave the house all day that day. Haven't you ever heard of home delivery? And Columbo's like, well, yeah, I have paper delivered to my house every morning. Beth tells him, well, that's the answer. No, no, that, that won't answer it. No, no, the newspaper on the foyer table, that was a late edition. Columbo asks Beth if she was home all day, who brought in the newspaper? Well, Bryce must have brought it home. Yes, but Bryce came in through your room. He didn't come in through the front door. How did that newspaper get to the other end of the house? Beth says that Bryce had to have brought it home, and during her confusion that night, she must have picked it up and put it on the foyer table when she went to answer the door. Columbo then asked why she didn't bring his attache case along with the paper. I didn't see it. He didn't see it, gee. Beth's mother steps up to defend her daughter by saying people are inconsistent when they're in shock and that it's foolish of him to expect rational behavior at a time like that. Which, you know, is actually very true. Well, I'm sure you're probably right about this. Well, look, I'm sure both of you have a great deal to talk about, so I'm going to run along. But before he leaves, he's sure to get his $11 back from Mrs. Chadwick. Listen, about that $11, ma'am, uh... Thank you very much. Now we are at the county courthouse. Wow, what an interesting comb over this man has. The hearing officer is played by John Lormer. He had loads of guest appearances on television. Oftentimes his roles included judges, preachers, and professors. Have you, ladies and gentlemen, concluded your deliberations? Yes, sir, we have. Clerk? So the jurors hand over their conclusion about whether or not Beth's killing her brother was an accident. This meeting isn't exactly a trial. It's called a coroner's inquest. These inquests are only conducted when a death occurs under questionable or sudden circumstances. A bit more interesting backstory. Do you remember in Dead Weight when I talked about how Peter Falk was not coming to work because he was kind of on strike about not being able to direct an episode like he was promised? Well, throughout production of this episode, Peter Falk kept asking which episode was he going to be directing, but nobody would give him an answer. So each day, Peter Falk arrived a little bit later, spent a little more time on his lines before each scene and everyone else just had to stand around and wait on him. Nobody could move on without him. Later on, Peter Falk finds out that the next episode has already been claimed by another director, leaving only one more episode left of the season. So he figures he's got to throw another dramatic fit. He decides to drive off the studio lot. Once again, the company had to shoot as much as they could without Peter Falk. So, guess who gets to return to play the back of Columbo's head? The same body double from Dead Weight. When I worked on that video, I couldn't find who the body double was. But since then, I learned that his name was Richard Lance. Unfortunately, I cannot find a picture of him anywhere. I'm very curious about what he looked like, but that might have to remain a mystery. So because of Peter Falk's latest stunt, Universal placed him on suspension. Peter Falk's lawyer, Burt Fields, informed the studio that Peter will not be returning to work until he's given his directing assignment as promised. Universal was ready to fight, but NBC was not. NBC knew Columbo was gold and they had a hit. They demanded Universal get Falk back on set. Universal had no choice but to give Peter Falk his way. So, like I mentioned in Dead Weight, Peter Falk will get to direct the final episode of season one. She's home free. You watch. Jupiter and Venus are in good aspect with Pluto. Columbo's reaction to that is similar to what mine would be. The jury finds that Bryce Chadwick came to his death July 21st, death being caused by three 38 caliber bullet wounds in the upper chest. The death of Bryce Chadwick was an accident. The guy behind Beth that had zero reaction to the verdict is named Hans Mobus. He's another superstar uncredited actor with 385 roles in movies and television, with only three of those roles being credited to him. We are going to see him one more time in a future Columbo episode. Moving on to our next uncredited actor, Katherine Jansen. She has been uncredited in over a hundred roles. Not only was she in loads of very popular TV shows, but some of the movies she was in are quite significant, such as Blazing Saddles, The Godfather Part II, Young Frankenstein, Annie Hall, Ghostbusters, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, Big Business, and The Naked Gun. She will also show up in four more upcoming Columbo episodes. The man sitting next to our uncredited Catherine is Buzz Barbie. What a name. Now even though Buzz Barbie's resume is mostly uncredited, he's only got 20 roles. 
He must have gotten tired of the lack of credit. We are going to see him in the future as well in one more Columbo episode. And finally, there's Clark Ross sitting next to Mrs. Chadwick. We'll see him in four more upcoming Columbo episodes. He has over 200 uncredited roles in movies and television. Our list of crediting uncredited actors is growing. So the death of Bryce has been ruled an accident. Therefore, there doesn't need to be any kind of formal trial. And I'll get more into that near the end of the video. See? The Planet Alignment Lady is played by Marsha Wallace. We have already talked about her once because of her credit she was given for appearing in Murder by the Book where she did not appear. This is the only episode of Columbo that she appears in. She is known for being in almost every single episode of the Bob Newhart Show, as well as her common voice acting for the TV show The Simpsons as Edna Crabapple. She also did voice acting any time her character was put into a Simpsons video game. Well, now that Beth realizes she is home free, she says she wants to take the whole jury out to dinner. Back to normal, eh? Oh, no. That's exactly what I don't want. What do you mean? Well, I think it's time we made a few changes that I broke a few patterns. Well, Peter invites Beth out to lunch to celebrate. Beth asks if she can take a rain check because she's got a few appointments. Would you set up a meeting with the heads of the departments? What's the agenda? Reorganization. Mother? Well, she's behaving a bit unhinged, but maybe she's just really excited. Neither Peter nor Beth's mother know exactly how to react. Columbo also seemed to find that little dialogue interesting. Morning, Mr. Hamilton. Oh, Lieutenant. You remember me? Yes, I've got a very good memory. That's a funny response, Peter. Imagine telling people you have a very good memory every time you remember them. Columbo says he envies Peter because sometimes he can't even remember his own telephone number. Nowadays, that's pretty much the only phone number we do remember. I couldn't help overhearing that she turned you down for once. You want to grab a bite with me? You want to ask me some questions, is that it? I love how Columbo answers Peter without answering Peter. Well, uh, listen, it's my treat. <laughs> All right. So Columbo takes Peter to a drive-in burger and milkshake joint. This building still exists and is still a burger place. From what I've gathered, it is currently called the Oinkster and has quite good reviews. If I'm ever in Los Angeles, I'll surely stop by for a bite. All right, don't forget to let me know before you leave. I need to take the tray. People are always driving off with our trays. Right. I'll remember. Thank you. You're welcome. This nice waitress is played by Susan Barrister. This role in Columbo is her first of four acting credits. She was also in Griff, Night Moves, and Brothers. And that's it. But hey, she's got a more impressive filmography than I do. Columbo asks Peter if he and Beth are going to be married. Yes, we're going to be married, but we haven't set the date yet. Peter takes a look at that plain, dry burger and decides to just drink his Coke. Columbo asks why Peter drove over to Beth's the night of the shooting so late. Let's say the propulsion was anger. Huh? What, what, what do you mean? Columbo's burger looks like it's mostly bun. Peter explains when he got back from a business trip, there was a letter waiting for him from Bryce saying to lay off Beth or else. Professional discrimination, things like that. You got there just in time for the commotion. It's quite a coincidence, isn't it? You think that uh, the two of us did Bryce in together? Do I think it was a conspiracy? No, no. Oh, no, no chance of that. No, sir. Peter then brings up the fact that he has been accused of being a fortune hunter. He assures Columbo he is not. I love Beth, with her money or without her money. Matter of fact, I was quite prepared to quit the company. I'm sorry about poor Bryce being killed, but it has gotten Beth out from under his thumb. I like Columbo's response to that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, way out. Huh? I think that her brother's death is the best thing that ever happened to her. And Columbo figures it's time to leave. Hey, mister! You forgot the tray! <laughs> Now we are back at the Chadwick residence where a pretty blue 1970 Ferrari 365 GTB for Daytona sits at the front entrance. Columbo is trying to find out where Beth is. Yes, yeah, she's at the beauty parlor, Eugene. Columbo mentions that the car smells new. It is, sir. It was just delivered. Oh, what do we have here? A boom mic of sorts? That's a wonderful piece of machinery. I'm going to go around the side of the house here and I'm going to conduct an experiment. Charles asks if he can help Columbo, which I like Columbo's response. No, Charles, it's a kind of uh, do-it-yourself thing. So Columbo walks the path that Bryce should have walked if Beth's story were true. He takes off his shoe and studies it closely. 
Charles and Hilda the maid are watching him, not quite sure what to make of his experiment. Hilda is played by Frances Neely. Her acting career wasn't too wild, although she did make it into Ghostbusters. That alone is important because I don't believe Ghostbusters will ever be forgotten. The scene fades into Columbo's car, driving down the same road he drove down in Death Lends a Hand. I recognize it because of the Indian head sign. And wouldn't you know it, this part showing Columbo driving is the exact same scene right before he gets pulled over by the cop in Death Lends a Hand. Which is really a great shot, but it makes the next view of Columbo's car kind of strange because now the top is down again, parked in front of Eugene's. Columbo tells the hostess at the desk that he's looking for Beth Chadwick. Well, right through that door, Lieutenant. Cubicle four. Thank you. She then calls attention to his cigar. What about it? Oh, the fragrance is not um, compatible. That is the nicest possible way to say she doesn't want him smoking his cigar in there. So Columbo hands her the cigar and she doesn't know exactly what to do with it. All right, now the first thing I noticed when Columbo enters this gaudy room, other than the terribly pink walls, is this red carpet. The waiting area did not have carpet. The actual hair salon has carpet. This is clearly just a load of props put into this carpeted room because there is no way, not even by rich Beverly Hills standards, there would be carpet in a hair salon for reasons of hygiene. But I do enjoy how much they make Columbo look out of place here. Columbo finds Beth getting her hair done and her hands massaged. He lets her know Charles said she would be here. Saw your new car, by the way. I suppose you have to order those things weeks in advance, don't you? Yes, that's right. Gee, that's funny, though. If you had to order the car some time ago, that would mean that you knew in advance that you were going to change your style. Beth ignores that statement and stands up to look at her oh. new hairstyle. Miss Chadwick, you look sensational. You really think so? I'd say you were a new woman. Her hair does look very nice and bouncy. And by the way, the song playing in the salon is the same song that General Hollister ordered Helen to dance with him to at his house. Columbo says he wants to meet Beth at her house because he has a couple questions to ask her. Is this really necessary? Well, in a way it does, yes. I promise it won't take long. Do you see that man carrying a thing? That is Mike Lowley. Now at this point, many of you probably don't know who he is, but some of you do. Mr. Lowley claims to have been on the set of Columbo every single day. I've read that he and Peter Falk were good friends, and that on filming days when the studio sent a driver out to pick up Peter Falk, they were instructed to pick up Lowley on the way. Mike Lowley has over 480 uncredited roles. 25 of them are listed on Internet Movie Database for Columbo, although I have found him in at least 26 episodes. And he could be in even more, so we'll keep our eyes open. This episode is the first appearance that I have found, but if anyone has found him earlier than this episode, let me know. But from this point on, we are going to be playing Where's Mike Lowley? Uh, Lieutenant, your cigar. The very kind hostess at Eugene's is played by Barbara Rhodes. We will see her one more time in a future Columbo episode. And like many of our extras in Columbo, she has so many one-time guest appearances in popular and unpopular TV shows of the 70s and 80s. Now that Columbo and Beth are at her house, we will get to learn why he was studying his shoes earlier. You figured that your brother had to walk around the side of the house like this. Now you see, he had to walk on, on grass. Beth begins giggling and wanting to know what the point of this is. Well, today's Thursday. Gardener cuts the grass on Thursday. Excuse me a minute. Columbo bends over to take off one of his shoes. You see? Grass. Yes, well, that's only natural. But you know there was no grass on your brother's shoe? Columbo says her brother was shot one week ago, on Thursday. He had a look at all the photographs of the body and even had them blown up. But for the life of him, he couldn't find any grass on his shoes. Why? It was freshly cut. And it was sticky because it was at night and it was dew. Beth compliments his work and says he must have had particles of grass on his shoes. But they were probably brushed off on the carpet. And unfortunately, the room's been cleaned. Just one more thing. I guess Charles has the stepladder by now. Columbo's shoe teleports right back onto his foot and they walk back to the porch entryway. Then Columbo climbs the ladder and takes down a potted plant from up on a pedestal. 
He says he found what looks like the imprint of a key in this plant's dirt. That was some very detailed detective work, Columbo. Beth says there was a spare key in there. Bryce didn't know about it. I also removed it myself recently because I had second thoughts. What do you mean by second thoughts? Beth explains that if there were a burglar prowling about, he might find the key, and then what good would the alarm system be? Good point. All right, Lieutenant, I think you finally overstayed your welcome. Glumbo explains that he is just trying to tie up loose ends, and he means no offense by it. You see, I'm compulsive that way. It's just, uh, well, that's what my wife says about it, just... <laughs> Are you really? I used to think she said, are you really, about the fact that he was married, like she couldn't believe it. But I think she's saying that about his compulsive nature. I told the truth the night it happened, so whatever your little compulsions may be, I'm afraid I must insist you leave me alone. And now we see Peter playing pool at some kind of clothing store. Yeah? Well, is that it? <laughs> no, I haven't finished. <laughs> Sounds like Peter is politely wanting her to be done shopping. You're not bored, are you? No, no. That's good. Some more music trivia for you. This song playing in the shop is the same song that played at Barney's Beanery when Margaret goes to visit Columbo. Oh, certainly. While Beth is manically trying on outfits, she asks Peter if he has the meeting set up for this afternoon. Uh, yes, but I was wondering, Beth. Why well, don't you think it's a little premature, perhaps another week for things to ease up? No, it must be today. All right, it's up to you. Peter strolls over to the bar. Yes, there is a bar in the shop as well. Whoever set up this boutique was being very considerate of the husband. Then Beth walks out of the dressing room with a couple of purple hankies wrapped around her. And I appreciate Peter's reaction to her outfit. What do you think? Interesting. What does that mean? Well, it's wild. A uh, little out of your style, though, isn't it? I'm perfectly capable of making my own decisions. Oh, what is that silver dress over there on the, uh, on the rail? Judging by Peter's facial expression from this little interaction, he seems a bit put out by her off-the-wall clothing impulsions. Uh, Beth? See this dress shop worker in the background? That is Cosmo Sardo. He is another to add to our list of professionally uncredited actors over 500 uncredited acting roles, five of them being in Colombo. So we'll see him again, of course. Beth, why don't you finish your wardrobe? I'm going back to the office. No, no, I want you to wait till I'm ready to go. And I'm not sure what's gotten into you, but I'm not sure I like it. Peter has made it clear that he doesn't care for Beth's sudden change in behavior. She's trying to buy some pants for herself and a dress for Peter, but he is not that kind of guy. Beth is left speechless for a moment until this gal making the sale of a lifetime breaks the silence. Did you want to try this on? Yes, this one and that blue dress over there. And guess who the sales rep is here? Yes, it's our fully clothed, nude model from Suitable for Framing, Katherine Dark. Yeah, what is it? Uh, if I'm interrupting something... No, I... you're not interrupting anything. And now it's time for the oh-so-important meeting that Beth wanted. Peter is here, along with Beth's mother, and even Enrico made it. Uh, um, and I guess in Beth's nutty reasoning, she figured conducting a meeting meant wearing a pink train conductor's hat, as well as some furniture upholstery for a jacket. Of all the clothes she tried on, this is what she went with. Beth authoritatively instructs everyone to take their seats. This executive man is played by Mickey Golden. We've already met him at the art gallery party in Suitable for Framing. And this very gentlemanly man getting the seat for Mrs. Chadwick is played by Jeffrey Sayer. We've already met him too in Murder by the Book. He is the one who shoves Miss Lasanka out of the way at the theater. As you all well know, this is a family-owned firm. Therefore, as of today, I am assuming the presidency. Mrs. Chadwick is shocked by this. Beth must have lost her marbles, she thinks. I would like to announce the elevation of Mr. Peter Hamilton to executive vice president in charge of accounts. And Peter looks like he feels very awkward. Has she gone off the deep end? My brother was a traditionalist. I want to break new ground. 
Beth starts talking about cutting accounts and criticizing how much the company is selling others' products rather than their own. Beth, forgive me, but that is our job. Nonsense! Now look, Beth, I don't want to be difficult, but I... I, I Fred, definitely... I don't mean to interrupt you. If you disagree with my approach, you're perfectly free to sever your relationship with the firm. Fred figures Beth is a few bricks short of a full load, but at the moment, he can only bend to her well. No. Beth, I, I feel that I can accommodate myself to your way of thinking. Yes, I'm sure you can. Then Beth adjourns the meeting, but before people are able to get up, she slips in one more announcement. One more thing, a happy and personal note. I'd like to announce my engagement to Mr. Hamilton. I think Peter is realizing that the tiles have fallen off of Beth's roof. A few kind men go over to Peter to congratulate him. Peter's just kind of awkwardly hanging around, not quite sure what to do. And Mrs. Chadwick doesn't know what to say to him either, but she knows exactly what to say to Beth. You must be out of your mind. The lady handing Beth papers to sign is Leota Richards. I'm sure you remember her by now. She was a theater patron in Murder by the Book and a party guest at the art gallery and suitable for framing. Don't be naive, Mother. Who else can take over and still keep it in the family? You're getting old, Mother, or hadn't you noticed? Then there's a knock at the door. Am I interrupting something? Why, hello there, fella. How you doing? Colombo has a treat for little Enrico, which is so kind and considerate of him, but Enrico wants nothing to do with this dry old treat. He is a pedigree silky after all. They only eat gourmet treats prepared by servants. And you'll notice here that the dog is not barking, but the editors added in some barking. Mrs. Chadwick says she is leaving. Mother, we'll go into this later. As you wish. It's sad to see Mrs. Chadwick give in to her mad hatter daughter. Well, Columbo, what is it now? We've talked about keys and grass and newspapers. So right here, Beth says, oh, thank you, twice. And it doesn't really make sense. The first time, maybe Columbo was trying to help her take her coat off, but you can't really see that. And then the second time, it was dubbed over whatever she originally said. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, you know how one thing leads to another. Columbo says he had a thought that occurred to him about the burnt-out light bulb in their entryway, and it is keeping him awake at night. So he went over to her house this morning to take a look at it. And then Columbo flings out of his pocket the light bulb. <laughs> you brought it with you. Beth is at first quite amused by this. This is a 100-watt bulb. Got a life, 750, 800 hours. Then you burn the outside light uh, 8, 10 hours a day. So that means it would last two, two and a half months. Columbo goes on to say that he hates changing bulbs outside because by the time they burn out, they are full of dust and dead bugs. Then he comes back around to Beth's bulb. Why is that bulb dirt and dust free? That bulb is clean as a whistle. Now I think that's kind of strange, don't you? Hanging there long enough to burn out, but not hanging there long enough to get dirty. Beth has the ultimate explanation. If the bulb is clean, it's because servants cleaned it. They cleaned the burnt out bulb. My question about the bulb is why hasn't it been changed yet by Charles or someone else by this time? It's been a week since Bryce's death, and yet that burnt-out bulb stayed in the socket. Now Beth has had enough of Columbo, and she kicks him out. I don't ever want to see you again. You'll be refused admittance to my house and to this office. If you think you have a case against me, go to the district attorney. Is that clear? Columbo notices Beth is missing a few cups in her cupboard and figures he better go. Before Columbo walks out, he wanted to say one more thing, but Beth stopped him. No more questions. I just wanted to return your bulb. Now, Columbo, if that bulb is any kind of evidence, why in the world would you hand it over to the prime suspect? Anyway, Columbo closes the door and Beth goes ahead and snaps. What can we do about him? <laughs> Whoa, Beth. I like the bulb-breaking sound effect. It sounds very big. Beth, take it easy. Calm down. Oh, stop saying calm down. There Beth, must be somebody in Beth, city government down. who can do something. Calm down. Take it easy. Well, is that your professional advice? Peter observes that the cheese has slid off Beth's pizza. What in the world has gotten into you? We never argued like this before. Then Beth's shoulders relax, and she rushes to hug Peter, saying that they aren't arguing. Beth asks Peter what's wrong. Number one, uh, this business of arbitrarily promoting me. To say the least, it smacks up high-level nepotism. It's, uh... Nepotism is when those with power or influence favor relatives and friends, especially by giving them jobs. Then Peter mentions a second thing that's bothering him. You announced our engagement without even letting me know. 
I was just as surprised here as everybody else. We, we are going to get married, aren't we? That's not the point. I would like to have had a hand in the decision. Another example of Beth trying to wear Peter's trousers, and he does not like it. Peter tells Beth that this isn't like her to act this way, and that it's way out of character. Well, if I've changed, it's because I thought you'd like a more exciting woman. A change, yes, but a complete metamorphosis. I'm not sure, Beth, you're the same person. Maybe I'm not. Beth then suggests that maybe Bryce was right about Peter being the wrong sort of man for her. And she stomps out of the room. Poor Peter is left to think about everything that just happened in the last ten minutes. Looks like he decided to spend his evening at the bar. What's that, the third? <laughs> I get paid not to come. Just keep him coming, that's all. The bartender is played by John Francis. We'll see him once more in Colombo as another bartender. His acting career wasn't too heavy, and he also isn't exclusively an uncredited actor. If you have a look at his filmography, he plays a bartender slash waiter in 14 of his 43 acting roles. And one last musical trivia is the song playing in this bar. We very first heard this song in Ransom for a Dead Man. It's one of the main songs in that episode. And then the song makes another auditory appearance in Murder by the Book. Oh, I just can't resist strawberries. Oh, I'm glad you like them. <laughs> well, what do you know? Columbo is at the bar as well. Peter notices him and strolls over to greet him. Well, I didn't think you people were supposed to drink on duty. Oh, Mr. Hamilton. Oh, no, that's coffee. Oh, I don't drink. Columbo doesn't drink? What do we drink to? Oh, I don't know. How about you and me? Fine. You will keep me posted, Lieutenant. Oh, yes, I will, yeah. You know, there's only one thing that I'm not clear about. To the knock of opportunity. Well, maybe he means he doesn't go out drinking, but he will accept a drink when offered. I'd maybe describe Columbo as the penultimate drinker. It's quite a coincidence, uh, you and I both meeting in the same place like that. Yes, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Columbo's so funny. Peter asks what Columbo is reading, and he says it's the transcript from the coroner's inquest. Then Columbo changes the subject by congratulating Peter on his engagement. Peter says he's not necessarily engaged. Oh, really? What happened? Peter doesn't want to talk about that, so he changes the subject now. Lieutenant, why are you hounding Beth? Columbo responds with an extremely Columbo-type response. Hounding? Who, me? Oh, no, I'm not hounding anybody. Oh, no, no. No, what I'm trying to do is get to the bottom of this thing. You don't really think that Beth killed her brother in cold blood, now do you? As a matter of fact, I do. Then Peter chuckles, thinking maybe he's joking, but Columbo's expression remains serious. I think she set it up. I think it was deliberate. And I think you can help me prove it. Columbo begins talking about his wife and how she has a proverb for every situation. He says they had an argument last night, and she says, You're putting the cart before the horse, which turned on a light bulb for Columbo. On the night of the murder, you said something. And you tell me you got a terrific memory. Then you'll know whether or not Beth Chadwick murdered her brother. All right. And what do I remember? Before we learn the answer to that, the scene changes to Beth in her bedroom, setting the alarm just like the night of the murder. Rather than her modest mother's nightgown, she's got on a silky little gown. Instead of a glass of water, she's got a glass of liquor. Replacing the delicious chocolates is a cigarette. And if you notice her porcelain doll is missing, replaced with a fancy pants ashtray, she's definitely a different woman. Seems like she's reading over some important looking books that probably pertain to the family company. At least she's trying to understand her new job. Then we hear someone rattle the handles to her French doors. Who is it? Who's there? Her first reaction makes sense. To grab her gun and try to get a hold of the police. But then she changes her mind about the police. She assumes it must be Columbo. Now I know Columbo was asking her a lot of questions and visiting her, but how could she really honestly think that it was Columbo rattling the door handles in the night. Come on, Lieutenant. Come in and have a drink. She seems to absolutely have every intention of Columbo opening the doors and shooting him dead. When nobody responds to her beckoning, she turns off the alarm and goes to the door. This is the way your brother came in that night, isn't it? 
She has a flash of memory of Bryce coming in, like Columbo describes. This is very similar to when Columbo was visiting with Leslie Williams about the way her husband must have been shot. Beth asks how'd Columbo get in, and he says the same way her brother did, with a spare key. What do you expect to prove by this bit of nonsense? Well, I don't want to prove anything, ma'am. I came to arrest you. And Beth laughs at him. And I did have a reason for coming in this way. I wanted to see the look on your face. I knew it wasn't an accident the first night. I knew it as soon as I saw that newspaper, but I didn't have any proof. I had to wait for your fiancé to give it to me. From Peter? You can see she still has a softness for Peter. Columbo goes over her side of the story, which is that the alarm woke her, she grabbed the gun, and started shooting what she believed was a burglar. Which is exactly what happened. Couldn't be. Columbo states that Peter Hamilton heard both the shots and the alarm. Beth says, well, of course he did. What difference does that make? Oh, big difference. He heard the shots first, then the alarm. That's the cart before the horse. I mean, how could the alarm wake you if the shots came first? Beth suggests Peter is mistaken, but Columbo assures her that Peter is a very good lawyer and he prides himself on his memory. While Columbo is telling Beth that with Peter's testimony and the other holes in her story, he believes they'll convict her, she has the gun hidden behind her little veil. They stare at each other for a moment and then suddenly she decides to point the gun at Columbo. She's completely off her rocker. She believes she'd be able to shoot Columbo and get away with it. Oh, really? You don't want to do that? Policeman outside, what would be the point? She continues to point the gun at him with a wild look in her eyes. Besides, you're too classy a woman. Saying that to Beth disarmed her, and she hands the gun to Columbo. Although there is nothing classy about Beth. She is as selfish and conceited as you can get. But you see, Columbo has street smarts. Telling someone they are classy would make them hesitate on anything they are about to do. Maybe. Well, it's worth a shot anyway. Columbo tells Beth to get dressed and take all the time she needs. That alone seems quite risky. With a woman like Beth, who, if you ask me, has only one oar in the water, who knows what she might do out of Columbo's sight. She could go grab another weapon, or even escape somehow. Columbo steps outside and sighs, lighting up a new cigar and looking out into the night. A great Columbo pose to end the episode with. Now some of you may be wondering, how can Beth go to trial since Bryce's death was labeled an accident? Many of you likely have heard of double jeopardy, which prevents an accused person from being tried again on the same or similar charges. The Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution reads, Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. So how could Columbo even arrest Beth, right? Well, remember I mentioned what we saw earlier was a coroner's inquest. An inquest uses witnesses, but suspects are not permitted to defend themselves. If the verdict had been murder, then criminal prosecution may follow and suspects are able to defend themselves. This episode tends to have mixed opinions from people, but I personally really enjoy it. I like how we got to see the clever intended murder and then the actual murder that didn't quite turn out the same. I really enjoyed Beth's character change from a controlled woman to a loose cannon. She was really incriminating herself with all the outrageous decisions and actions she was making practically the day after Bryce's death. She showed no time of mourning over this awful accident. And I enjoyed the acting, and the humor, and I think several of the scenes are memorable. I noticed in this particular episode, unlike many of the others, Columbo doesn't really strike up much chemistry or friendship between him and the killer, like he does in the majority of episodes. Instead, he had a bit of a chemistry with Peter. I have only a few little complaints, and then how about I rate this episode? My first complaint is that Beth really did not even need to kill her brother. I don't see why she couldn't just go off and marry Peter. Who cares if he got fired or he quit? He's a respected lawyer that would have been successful at a different company. But then, we wouldn't have an episode, would we? My second small complaint is actually the gotcha. Even though I enjoy the ending, I also don't understand why it was done this way. What a terrible risk it was for Columbo to enter her home without knocking first to arrest her. I know he says he did that so he could see the look on her face, but I think that might actually be illegal. Taking her by surprise like that when she clearly isn't always playing with a full deck? I'm afraid I don't quite understand. But anyway, these things don't bother me badly enough. And since I tend to be a pretty generous Columbo fan, I rate this episode 5 Columbo cigars out of 5. I find it far too entertaining to dock any cigars. 
Now maybe if I was rating on a 10 cigar system, things would be different. I don't think I could give it 10 out of 10, but to keep it simple, we're sticking with five cigars and I do think it earned the five out of five. Well, before I go, I have something very important to say, and that is thank you. Thank you to my generous friends who gift me the most wonderful coffees. Thank you to my amazing viewers who leave me such encouraging comments. And thank you for subscribing because it reminds me that there are loads of other Columbo fans out there that enjoy the same things I do. So, I'll see you next time. So, uh, I'm going to run along. Thank you for the coffee, ma'am.